Hi, my name is Brian Nosek. Thanks for having me at this meeting. I'm delighted to be part of it. Uh, and I'm excited to talk about issues relating to big team science. Uh, this has been a movement and an expansion of engagement with how we can do science better in general, but particularly how we can work more collectively to address some of the challenges of having strong rigor, good transparency, uh, and really wrestle with the problems that we want to solve with the best methods to solve them, rather than redesigning the questions that we investigate based on the resources that are just available to us individually. And the real power of big team science is to bring together people with different sets of skills and interest, to bring together resources, to aggregate those, and to really push the boundaries of the kinds of questions and the comprehensiveness that we can ask those questions and derive answers uh, from them. So there are just um, so many exciting projects that have emerged over the last 10 years that really illustrate the potential and power of working collectively uh, to push the boundaries of our various areas of interest. And I wanna talk first a little bit about some of the principles that we've learned uh, in running some of these projects for how to make them as effective as possible. And these won't be new to many of you that have been involved uh, in coordinating some big team science projects but they're worthwhile for us to continuously remind ourselves of for how we can maximize the quality of the work that we do in these kinds of projects and the community engagement parts of it. How do we keep everybody involved, feeling like they're valued and giving everybody meaning for their contributions uh, to collaborative projects? So one of the most important ways to get started is to very clearly articulate the goals of the project and how it's going to be approached so that when you engage the community of potential collaborators, they understand what they're getting into, why it's being pursued that way, and how they could be involved. A real important element, because these projects are distributed, is to avoid single points of failure. It's so hard in these big projects to have everything relying on one person or one activity or one straight pipeline. If you can create the project in a way that makes it modular so that people can work at their own pace, that subgroups uh, are responsible for different components of the project, then it's much more resilient to the realities that occur when you have 100 200, 500, 1,000 different people involved in some way or another, some portion of them are not going to be able to follow through for whatever reason uh, of the components of their part of the project. And so by having focusing on modularity, you can make sure that the project itself is resilient to different pace that different teams are able to operate and even the inevitable uh, dropout that can occur uh, because of the realities of life. Another very helpful feature of effective big team science projects is to make it easy to get started to be involved in the project. If the ask is a very large ask for even getting involved, reading through reams of documentation to understand what the project is, needing to commit a substantial amount of resources right from the start uh, to be able to participate in the project, it'll be very hard to get collaborative energy going. But if there are small ways that people can get involved, both to see and understand how the project works, to see and understand how it is they can make meaningful contributions, and then they can incrementally step up as it is clear that their contributions matter, that they are a meaningful part of the project and that the project is rewarding. Uh, by making it easy to get uh, going uh, and then increase involvement over time. And related to having a low barrier to entry is being attentive to designing the project and the different ways in which people can contribute that are aligned with the skills that are available in the community that one is trying to engage for participation. 
how is it that we can make sure that if we are in, engaging the interest of a lot of undergraduates who may not yet have some of the statistical experience uh, that might be necessary for parts of the project, how do we orient the components of the project so that they can contribute the skills and resources that are available to them and make meaningful contributions and making it clear how they can do that. For all of this, the better the documentation, the more likely that people are able to understand what they need to do, how they need to do it, and how their contribution matters. And so using collaborative tools, communication platforms like Slack, uh, documentation or storage platforms like OSF and GitHub, these are very useful for creating a commons so that everyone knows where the work is being done, what the work is, and how they can find information uh, because it's so distributed across different people. And coupling with the good documentation is that leadership really matters. It's very hard to do really big collaborative projects uh, with no leadership structure at all. But that doesn't mean that leadership needs to be a dictatorship or authoritarian. <laughs> Rather, leadership can be a vehicle for effective management of the project, setting timelines, being strong about communication of what the expectations are, when things are going to happen, setting clear expectations and deadlines of this is when this event's going to occur. If you're going to contribute, contribute by this date, and we're going to keep moving on. Setting those expectations clearly and explicitly is actually a help for everyone so that they can gauge whether they can contribute in that expected timeline. And by having clear deadlines and timelines that are adhered to, it helps to manage that challenge of uh, working against the slowest component. So if you've implemented modularity effectively, then some groups will drop out, but you're not just waiting forever uh, for those groups uh, because uh, they can't meet the expected timelines. Open practices, sharing and being transparent about all the components of the project and how it is that they are operating can be very helpful for uh, ensuring trust among the members of the team uh, knowing what is happening, everyone feeling like they can be involved, can comment, can react to the direction of the project so that everybody's intellectual uh, stances, everybody's interpretation can be accounted for in trying to understand what, what, what was learned uh, and how to communicate uh, the work uh, as it has been done. And then finally, one that gets a lot of interest, importantly so, is really making clear what is in it for each contributor uh, for the project. Uh, it would be great if we all could just do whatever we wanted to spend, our, spend whatever we wanted to spend our time on and not have to worry about the reward system of getting our job, keeping our job, advancing in our careers. But the reality is that those external pressures matter. And it doesn't just come, these projects don't just come from a notion of service uh, from everyone that's involved although that plays a big role in many of these projects. So the more that it can be planned in advance and articulated very clearly before people get involved in the project, how it is that they will be, what the rewards are uh, for participating, even if it's to say there aren't any explicit rewards other than potentially being an author if we're able to publish a paper and maybe learning something about the collaboration that happens in big projects like this. If that's what it is, just say that's what it is. Uh, and then people will be able to make informed decisions about whether uh, to be involved or not. So some of the many uh, very effective big team science projects have had lots of these features or all of them prominent uh, and really ended up being rewarding and satisfying for the people that have been involved and made it easier to then form additional projects over time. So what I'd like to talk about next a little bit before closing is how is it that we can scale up big team science and make it so that it is a normal, ordinary, and rewarded part of the research system in addition to the other ways in which research gets conducted. We like to really think about the scaling up of new behaviors like data sharing or pre-registration or participating in big team science. 
as uh, following uh, the adoption process of any kind of new technology or behavior. And this diffusion of innovations model from Rogers from the 60s is a classic way that people talk about how there are different motivations at different stages of the adoption process of some new technical innovation. And you have to be attentive to those differing motivations. So for example, innovators who are the very first adopters or creators even uh, of a new technology or approach are motivated by the innovation, right? Are trying to just see and test out and are excited about trying these new things. They don't need the culture to be rewarding them uh, because they're in fact trying to change the culture in some way. They're pushing out the boundaries of how we can do research. Early adopters see the vision, the possibility, the potential in those new behaviors. Oh my gosh, the power of collaborative science is so clear. If you're at this meeting, you're probably in one of these two categories, right? You're either creating a new ways to collaborate at, at larger scale, or you're just motivated by the vision, excited about it. And even if the culture isn't supporting it uh, comprehensively, you want to be part of it. You want to help advance it. You want to lead it. The gap between early adopters and the mainstream, the early and late majority, is the hardest gap to traverse for getting new, new things like big team science into the mainstream. And the reason that it's hard is because as you get to the middle of the distribution, most people, they might see the value. They might say, in concept, it's great. I understand why people would want to do collaborative science. But there are additional motivations that need to be addressed. One is, I don't see others in my community doing that. So it's not really a thing that happens in my area of research. So shifting the norms to demonstrate that, in fact, this is a way to be successful, to do good research uh, in one's area is very important. And then the second part is, I, I really, I would do it, but... I'm not rewarded for that. I'm not going to get the rewards that I need in order to be successful in my career. So unless we can incorporate the reward system into how big team science is done, then I, I just can't justify participating. And of course, at the tail, there will be people that are just not really that motivated for it. They, uh, that's not my cup of tea to collaborate with others. I want to do it this way. And that's fine. It's going to be true of almost any system. So where we are in thinking about big team science is that we've already made a huge amount of progress in those innovators and early adopters. A lot of the early projects like the open science collaboration work, many labs projects demonstrated the potential for this. And there have been so much that's been happening to expand the scope and scale of that across different disciplinary boundaries, across different topical areas. The Psych Science Accelerator is playing a huge role in trying to institutionalize the idea of big team science within psychology and how is it that we can scale that up. There are similar efforts in other fields like education and otherwise. And there are lots and lots now of many, many projects, many uh, labs getting involved, many individuals getting involved in conducting research uh, together. These have really pushed the boundary to demonstrate proof of concept and to start to streamline the processes, the effectiveness of, of big team science projects, especially in the uh, behavioral sciences. And there's a lot of things that still need to happen to really get this work now into the mainstream. Where I think we start from the, this collection of projects and efforts is that there's been demonstrated quality and demonstrated impact of that work. As these projects get finished uh, with many different collaborators working uh, toward a single important problem, the attention and interaction of the, res the broader research community with those findings is almost always off scale compared to the standard res research reports that are occurred. And because there's so many minds in the planning and execution of these projects, they tend to be very high quality can adopt very high rigor and standards uh, compared to standard projects uh, because there's just so much engagement. <laughs> we want to make this as the strongest inference possible. But to really support those assets that all of these projects bring to it, we have to be attentive to the things that will bring the, the work into the mainstream and make this a common thing that people can do. 
the visibility of these projects when they're getting started, how they're promoted, how they're, pe they're, they're reported, all of that communication to the, the, the mainstream of the research community will be important for shifting those norms. Oh, that's something that happens in my field. I didn't know that people were doing this collaboratively. That's now exciting. I, maybe I'll get involved in the next one. That key issue of allocating and receiving credit, making sure that we keep advancing uh, things like the credit taxonomy to document how people are contributing to these projects so that even, so that instead of having to rely on, I'm one author of a many, many, many authored publication, I can document, here's the way that I contributed. And those are meaningful scholarly contributions that I should be rewarded for by my university, by my grant reviewers, whatever. Another challenge that many of these projects have had is how to get them funded. The typical funding models from uh, federal and private sources are funding a single lab or a single PI. And it's been difficult sometimes to get these those systems to adapt to we have 250 people involved in this project <laughs> and we need to distribute the funds to run the studies in these ways. So we still have to work through uh, with and be advocates with funding agencies for about how they can fund these projects effectively. And then there's just a lot of process and infrastructure that needs to mature uh, and continue to improve to make it so these kinds of projects are not just a project by project ad hoc event, but rather a program of work. Again, the Psych Science Accelerator has done a great job of this by creating a set of tools and processes, a governance structure, plans for succession on leadership and assignment of leadership for various projects, a set of operating principles so that you know what it means to get involved in projects. Many Babies has done this as well very effectively. Uh, and all of these, uh, obviously, finances uh, are an essential part. It's not, we can't just sustain these kinds of, this kind of work uh, based on everybody's goodwill. I we'll have to find ways uh, to secure those uh, resources to sustain and support that work. So I just want to, oh, the, the typing uh, or the layout is bad here, but I uh, just want to mention a couple of things that we can be thinking about. Every time we start and do one of these projects, how can we have that project help with the broader goals for moving big team science into the mainstream? Uh, the first uh, principle is focusing as we're thinking about what is it that we need to solve? What is the barrier from this being a niche thing and moving it into a mainstream thing that people do? And there's a natural part of uh, the research process in our subfields. The first element is focusing on the what and the why. What is it that we need to solve that's keeping it from being in the mainstream? Why do we need to do it that way? and then work on how is it that we can address that. And the reason to do that is to really think through what is the ideal that we want and then address the reality constraints uh, that keep us from getting there rather than just starting with the reality constraints and losing sight of the ideal end goal that we want these projects to be able to emerge as uh, they are of interest and of value and then have people be able to get involved and get rewarded and achieve uh, in the projects uh, as they do. An element, a related element to that is defining in advance what would success look like? What, kind, what would the world look like if big team science was a regular normal part uh, of the research system? And how would we know uh, that this is now normalized and mainstream? So that instead of thinking about abstractly, boy, it'd be great if this was a normal part of science, we can make some concrete indicators. What, would it, what do, we need, do we need to see to know that we're making progress of normalizing big team science in our areas of research? What has been great in this area of work and is sort of standard practice for many of these uh, collaborative projects is a real emphasis on agility, iterative development. What can we do now to do a really interesting big team science project? And how can we incrementally start to create that infrastructure, the collaborative pathways, the community engagement, the reporting styles to make it so this kind of thing is easier to do in the future. And so I think we just need to keep doing more of that. And it really has been evident that, uh, that groups are, oops, are focusing on how do we get started now? 
rather than, and this is the 80-20 rule, right? 80% of the solution requires 20% of the resources. And we can often get stuck on that hard 20% that will require 80% of the resources to get done. If we can delay the work on the hard part and instead make immediate regular progress on forming teams, on doing science to demonstrate the possibility to get skeptics uh, in, engaged in the reality of these actually are possible projects to do, to give funders and other stakeholders reasons to then invest in this and say, oh my gosh, I see the promise now. Okay, I'm convinced I need to invest in it. All of the work that we're doing that just gets us into the projects demonstrating value will help with then getting the resourcing to really solve that hard uh, last 20%. And to the extent that we can leverage the things that exist and not have to reinvent a new technology or a new thing, uh, that will keep the cost down in those early stages so that we can increment up from there rather than having to build a lot in order to get the project done at all. And then the last one is important because us at this meeting are idealists in that we're motivated about big team science. We're excited about the notion of big team science. We want to advance big team science. And the mainstream doesn't care as much as we individually <laughs> will care about it. So when we design the ways in which these projects will work, uh, if we want people to get on board, if we're relying on them being as idealistic as we are, then we're going to not be able to get from that early adopter level of adoption into the mainstream. So you have to think through how is it that we can design these projects so that the mainstream wants to be involved, can be involved, is excited to be involved, and re is rewarded for being involved. So thanks again for having me at this meeting. I'd be delighted to be thinking and hearing about how people are solving many of these challenges of doing uh, big team science and how we can work together to identify what the barriers are to make this a sustainable and scalable solution that will affect all of scientific practice. Thanks again.